So welcome uh, to the third episode of our uh, bi-weekly podcast on uh, politics around the world. Um, as uh, discussed before, this is a podcast that looks at uh, various political events and developments uh, in various regions and societies around the world from the perspective of comparative politics especially and of political theory, but also, you know, bringing in some tools from international relations uh, and the field of American government, so the major subfields of political science. Um, uh, so this, uh, as usually, we will have uh, one or two major topics that we will deal with today uh, and a, a smaller or shorter, uh, briefer topic. In fact, today we'll have one major topic and one briefer topic. The major topic or the, the one that on which we will spend more time uh, is um, Italy's new government. And uh, the one uh, that we will discuss at the end uh, is usually, you know, I usually choose a book or uh, a film or maybe an interesting aspect of politics. And this time um, we will talk about uh, a series of, of, of document, well, of, of informational uh, films uh, made by Frank Capra, the famous director, um, during World War II, uh, and under the, the title "Why We Fight," right, in which he tried to sort of, um, well, in which he conveyed some of the reasons, right, why we fought. Uh, well, we'll talk about that when uh, the time comes. Uh, let's start then with with the, the the first topic, which is Italy's new government. And you can, of course, uh, ask, uh, really, I mean, Italy's new government, I mean, why should we spend time talking about this? Um, you know, the, the, the sky is blue, the grass is green, and Italy has a new government. And that would be, you know, fair to say, it would be fair to say, uh, given that Italy has had since World War II or since the beginning of the current uh, republic, the current constitution, 60-something uh, uh, governments, so about one new government every year. <clears throat> Um, although it didn't have this many elections. Uh, and this has indeed to do with Italian political culture and, and other uh, factors. But uh, I think that this is a, a, a worthy subject to discuss um, because um, there are some specific things uh, about this, uh, this new government. Uh, and also it gives us an opportunity to kind of look at the state of Italian politics uh, and society uh, today. So... Um, so what is, uh, what is the context right, um, uh, in which this new government was formed? Uh, a, 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 different, a little bit different type of a, of a government, right? So, so the context is, uh, you need to understand the context in order to understand why this government was formed in the specific way in which it was formed. Uh, well, obviously, the, the major context is uh, COVID-19, right? The pandemic, which hit Italy uh, in Europe first, if you remember, but also it hit Italy. Um, uh, I mean, Italy was, was one of the worst hit countries uh, in the world uh, and certainly in, in Europe, although these things like go up and down. But from the beginning, we remember those images from the Italian hospitals uh, and so on. So there, there is still a huge uh, uh, um, health crisis uh, in, in Italy, they are still not out of it, as nobody is out of it yet, uh, except you know Greenland. Um, so, so that's that's one of the major the major factors. Uh, so Italy has had about ninety thousand uh, dead, right? Uh, at a population of um, uh, I don't have the specific uh, number, but I think it's about sixty million. Um, and uh, about 2.5 million uh, uh, who went through the disease, infected, who, who got sick, who actually got sick. So not just infected, but actually got sick. So these are, these are huge numbers. And its, its health system did collapse at various points um, and other, uh, you know, administrative systems. Um, and, and as a result, as a, you know, in, to respond to this, uh, COVID, to this COVID pandemic, uh, the government at the time... Um, instituted several lockdowns. Even today, there are different lockdowns in various parts of Italy. Um, uh, and these lockdowns meant that people could not go to work, which, right, so now you see what you're, where, where we're heading, uh, which led to also an economic crisis. An economic crisis that comes to an economy that was already and sort of always almost uh, sort of uh, limping along. 
Um, and I'm saying this although Italy has one of the, is one of the greatest economies uh, uh, in the world and, and also in Europe. The third largest, I think, in Europe, uh, eighth in the world, member of G8, G20. So, you know, we shouldn't forget that. But still, there was um, various sectors of the economy were, were terribly hit. Uh, and you have to remember that, you know, um, as I said, Italy already had uh, economic problems in the sense of high unemployment, um, <clears throat> uh, a significant proportion of gray or, or, or black sort of um, economy, um, meaning economy that is not really official. Um, and uh, and, and a, a level of, of income that was never very high, right? And we're going to talk about this in a, in a second. But uh, the point is that this COVID pandemic only increased and, and uh, radicalized the, 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 the economic problems uh, and the economic challenges uh, uh, facing Italy, especially since some of the services that in every single country were most hit by, by the pandemic uh, uh, were obviously the service industry, uh, tourism especially since nobody was traveling, and for Italy, both of these uh, areas, both of these uh, branches of the economy uh, represent a significant um, part of uh, Italian economy. So, so we have uh, a health crisis um, that Italy is still not out of it, as nobody is. Uh, we have an economic crisis that just uh, sort of, as I said, uh, made the pr economic problems that already were there even more dire. Um, and uh, to which uh, we will also add uh, two more factors. One is a political crisis, but this was not really, uh, let's put it this way, in an immediate sense. It was not a cause of forming a new government. As I said, that would just be, you know, a sort of a regular fact of life uh, in Italian politics, having a new government. Um, uh, but there is a specific constellation of Italian politics that, um, started around 10 years ago um, with the rise of a, of a populist movement, an anti-system movement called Movimento Cinque Stelle, five-star movement, uh, which changed the, the, the sort of a spectrum of Italian politics, which made the creation of a new government even more complicated. So there's health, there's economy, there's a specific political constellation, although not as direct cause of the of the of the dimension of the crisis, let me put it that way. Um, and uh, a fourth factor that we need to keep into consideration is uh, EU's, uh, the European Union's um, new, um, uh, not just the new budget, but this new plan of recovery and reconstruction, a sort of um, European Union's new Marshall Plan, which is called Next Generation EU. And that is a, that is a very significant factor in in, in the preamble, let me put it this way, to this to the formation of, of this new government and why it was formed this way and so on. So, so let's talk about this fourth uh, factor uh, a little bit, uh, this next generation EU. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> when, when the pandemic hit, um, you know, uh, the European Union was criticized for, for acting slowly and inadequately, uh, which was... Um, uh, quite unfair in a way, because uh, the European Union, people first of all don't understand what the European Union is, most of the people. Um, European Union is not a super government, it's not the government of Europe, it is um, a set of institutions that to which the member states delegate specific functions, right? And, and, and the which functions are delegated to those institutions so that from now on we don't take decisions individually, but we take them in common there, yeah? Um, that has been a, a, a source of a lot of negotiation and fighting and struggle because people, the states, right, the member states and st modern state is not very keen on, ha on um, uh, sort of delegating uh, sovereignty, right? Of delegating the uh, uh, exclusive right to decide over its territory and its members, which is sovereignty, right? This exclusive power. But the European Union is this unique experiment in, in world history, uh, which is an experiment in sharing sovereignty, not giving it away, but sharing it, right? In which, as I said, things um, on which uh, each state decided uh, individually uh, and exclusively are now delegated to a set of institutions 
where all these states take decisions in common. So, um, for example, uh, tariffs. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, the the taxes are paid by goods coming into uh, the um, any of these countries. Right now, the decisions on these are taken uh, at the level of the European Union by all the states in common in order to create a common market and so on. Um, but as I said, these the specific areas or fields over which which the st- over which the states delegated the responsibility to this common set of institutions um, are very they they were these responsibilities were delegated very punctually, right? So I'm gonna you know oh let's haggle 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 and then oh we decide okay from now on we're gonna take uh, decisions in common on this specific issue yeah oh let's add one more specific issue yeah? so you understand that it's not a wholesale abandonment of sovereignty, but very narrow things that uh, follow specific goals. And these are very uh, intricately and uh, 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 described in the, in the treaties that, that form these uh, institutions of the European Union. So you have a very detailed description of which specific areas, on which specific areas will this common set of institutions have uh, authority so all of us together. Now, health care is not one of those uh, areas. Yeah? Just like uh, uh, social uh, welfare, social protection is not one of those areas. Because here the states were keen on maintaining their unique uh, control. So it's kind of um, strange to then, to then complain that why didn't the European Union do something when it doesn't have attributions on health care. Uh, it has some, some, some bodies... Um, you know, that have to do with epidemics and so on, that those might not have acted fast enough and so on. But in terms of running healthcare and managing, it ha- the, those sets of institutions have no power, have no jurisdiction over this. But again, you know, as, as it usually happens, you know, uh, we're trying to be very precise when we set put together a specific institutions. Um, but we forget that people don't spend time on details. Yeah, people like simple things, right? So... There needs to be one guy in charge, and then he's to blame or he's to be praised for everything, right? So that's kind of the general atti- uh, attitude to, to politics, which is understandable, but it's, it's, not, it's incorrect. Just like in the United States, people think that the president is the most powerful, whereas it's Congress, actually. Uh, just read, you know, it's very simple, just read the Constitution. Um, but, but people have this idea that, oh, there needs to be one person in charge. Anyway. So, uh, but anyway, the, uh, the European Union was, was criticized. And, um, uh, you know, uh, Italy is one of the, well, it's one of the founding uh, members of the European Union. Alcide de Gasperi, the Prime Minister of Italy after the World War II, was one of the main uh, sort of figures, one of the fathers of Europe, as they're called. Um, <clears throat> so, and look at where Italy is located, right? It's in the heart of Europe, right? In the heart of Western Europe. So, you know, without Italy, there is no Europe. And that's true. Europe, not no European Union, but also no Europe in, in a way. Uh, and that's true. Um, and, and yet Italy was one of the hardest uh, hit. And the idea was, well, what, what is the European Union doing, right? Well, on healthcare, it doesn't have attributions, but it has other attributions of powers that the member states have delegated, right? And last year was also the time when... Um, uh, the, the seven-year budget, the, the budget of the European Union is a long-term budget, sort of a plan um, that, that, is, that is made every seven years to have sort of a coherence in, 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 in you know, uh, development and where they spend the money. Money that comes from very tiny contributions by each member state um, and from some tariffs and so on. Um, but, you know, because there are many member states and some of them are very large and have large economies, there's a lot of money there. Now, that's, that's, that's a resource that the European Union has. Although, if you look at the budget, that's not a big budget compared to what, what member states have. But what they did when they were working on the new budget and, and when all these uh, countries uh, like Italy, but not just Italy, were confronted by not just the health crisis, but the, um, uh, you know, the, the complementary uh, economic you know, difficulties created by the pandemic with, with whole industry, industries shutting down, uh, people out of jobs, and so on. So when the heads of states and government met uh, last year, they decided to, to, to create a sort of, as I said, of a Marshall Plan for Europe. And the Marshall Plan, if you remember, was <clears throat> that huge investment plan um, uh, and, you know, funding plan 
uh, that came from from U.S. resources that sort of helped the Europe uh, re, uh, rebuild after World War II. Now, now the pandemic is the deepest, gravest crisis affecting, let's say, Western Europe. Um, because centuries in Europe have had some other crises as well, but at least Western Europe, but Europe in general since World War II. So there is a sense of 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 okay, this is sort of this sort of an, uh, you know, apocalyptic sort of event like, like uh, World War II. And some countries have been, you know, direly hit uh, by it economically as well. So we need to sort of have a response which, you know, lives up to the challenge. If we were criticized as the European Union for not living up to the initial challenge, not responding quickly enough. Um, and, and this is why they created, besides the, the, uh, the seven-year budget, they also attached another um, sort of recovery and um, uh, development sort of uh, plan and fund, which is called Next Generation EU. And in total, this is the largest uh, sort of uh, funding, financial investment in, in Europe or financial plan or uh, in Europe, um, well, ever. It's one point. Uh, eight trillion dollars. Well, again, as I said, within the budget and the, the measures of the budget of the European Union, this is this is huge. If you look at the, the budget of the United States or of, of member states, you will see that they are larger. But I'm saying as a, as European Union, and out of this, so this 1.8 trillion, uh, one trillion would be the regular budget, uh, and about 0.8 seven, 750 billion. Yeah, would be specifically the sort of a new Marshall Plan, which is a you know which is a huge amount. Yeah, and when they decided who would, um, and this is money that doesn't come from taxes because they don't have that kind of money, uh, or they would need new sort of sources of income from the member states. But this is money that is borrowed by the entire European Union member states, from the market, and then it will be given to the member states according to needs, um, which I'm going to explain. Um, uh, will be given to the member states in the form of grants or of loans. Yeah, so two different things. So some money will just come, and, you, you, uh, and some money you have to pay back to the European Union. But the entire thing is basically based on loans from the market. So everybody will have to pitch in, yeah, to pay it back to the to the those uh, who who lent the money. And because this was guaranteed by the entire European Union as a whole, by all the member states, obviously there will be people to lend this money, or people, entities that to lend this money, because the guarantee is strong. Uh, so basically the EU leveraged its, 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 um, its power, its economic power, and its economic stature and uh, reputation uh, to be able to obtain such loans that individual member states would not have been able to obtain, uh, you know, especially when they are in crisis, like Italy and, and, and Spain and Portugal and so on. Uh, in order to get it as a European Union, sort of staking the reputation of a Germany or France or whatever, or, uh, you know, uh, Benelux on, on uh, you know, paying back these loans. And then once the EU as a whole receives this, this, these loans, they will be dispersed to, uh, dispersed to, uh, to member states um, as I said, according to needs. Now, what does it mean according to needs? How much does each state uh, get? Well, it's a combination of um, size uh, and uh, of the economy and needs with size of the population with how hard it, they were hit <coughs> by, by COVID. And because, of, it's a, because it's a combination of size of, of, of um, population and size of economy and problems in economy and how hard they were hit, basically Italy will get the, the largest amount of money. Because now it's not like in the regular budget, it's, it's a matter of you know, size of the, of the country and the, and the population, or size of the population of each country. It's, it's more sort of uh, proportional to the, uh, to the population. You kind of know how much each will get. There are some development funds as well. The point being that in this case, because of the constellation of factors that I just explained, Italy will get the largest amount from this, from this next generation EU fund, which is $209 billion. But this next generation EU fund as I said, is not just money that is going to be thrown at the member states, but uh, each member state needs to come up with a plan that they need to submit by April 30th 
um, that needs to be approved by the institutions of the European Union. And this plan needs to correspond to the priorities set in this next generation EU plan. Because this is not sort of a, you know, re, um, you know, um, uh, let's let's salvage something uh, plan. Let's uh, you know uh, emergency plan of of you know let's extinguish the fire. It's actually a, a more ambitious thing. It's a it's a it's a, um, they want to use this opportunity to not just uh, save you know the house but to rebuild it. Yeah, to rebuild the um, to to uh, rebuild and restart and reorganize and redirect development throughout EU along certain things. Uh, some things being common, um, I mean, there are different priorities and, and some of the uh, sources that I'm going to link to in the blog, you can look it up, what the priorities are, I'm not going to go, this is not, the, this discussion is not about the EU, um, <clears throat> but we need to understand the context. Uh, but for example, the, 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 the sustainability, uh, climate, uh, digitalization, uh, the digital economy. So these are some key aspects. So everything that 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 you know, the, the member states need to propose plans that are not immediate, are not just about saving you know the burning house. They are about reconfiguring the economy. It's a plan of development. It's a chance for the member states to create long-term development plans um, that and and to get money to sort of not just save themselves from this crisis, but to build a better future yeah so it's a very ambitious thing it's a very noble thing and as i said they, it has been done in, in after world war ii and this is why you know western europe became the most prosperous one of the most prosperous regions of the world uh, next to the united states uh, after world war ii from being in ruins which the united states was not um, uh, an amazing economic miracle uh, <clears throat> because uh, they benefited from the marshall plan but they also uh, use it well so this money will be dispersed, but not as a whole. The states need to propose a very, you know, established plan that needs to be approved. Yeah, that, that responds to these priorities. And also, uh, the money will, then they will get like fifteen percent first, and then they need to. There will be benchmarks, and after meeting each benchmark, they will get the next uh, sum of money. Right. So, so the money will be dispersed in as much as the, the states will um, uh, meet. Uh, the obligations that they have designed for themselves as a development uh, uh, strategy, which is wise, right? Because one of the worries was, okay, again, we're going to just throw money at states that don't know how to use them wisely. So why would we do that? Well, this is different now. So this is the context. And Italy has to, pro to, to, to submit this plan, which it says not yet. It, it hasn't yet by April 30th. So there's the COVID crisis. There's a <clears throat> economic crisis in Italy, there's a sort of a political crisis or context, that's a specific context, and then there's this next generation EU, which is not just an opportunity, but it's an obligation now uh, that they need to live up to, yeah? So this is the context in which this, this new uh, government was formed. Now let, let's look at the, um, um, the specific uh, political constellation in which... Um, in which this new government was formed, namely, <coughs> why did they um, uh, need to? Um, why did they need to, to form a new government? Right? Wasn't there a government in place? Were there some elections recently? No, they were not. There were not. So, um, so now the, again, the question becomes: Why a new government? And for that, uh, we will look at. Um, the, uh, the, the, the results of the last elections uh, to kind of get a sense of why now they had to have a new government since the last, last elections were in 2018. So let's, uh, let's look at that. So here you are. Uh, I hope you can see what I can see, I, um, which is the results of the, of the last elections. Now, the first thing that you see, if you're not familiar with it, is that Italy has a very fragmented political spectrum. Um, uh, it's not just because of the of the names here, which is the um, parties and alliances that got a seat in, in the parliament in the lower house, <clears throat> but also because many of these actually are alliances themselves, right? So these are alliances of, of smaller parties. So one, one feature of uh, Italian politics is um, political fragmentation and fluidity. Um, so you have many small parties, parties continuously form and break away from other parties 
Uh, and this has been going on. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's, as I said, it's a feature of uh, uh, Italian politics, especially um, since uh, or after the 1990s, right? Between World War II and 1990s, the, the one party that, that, that dominated um, um, <coughs> uh, Italian politics for 50 years was the Christian Democratic Party, which won basically every election for 50 years democratically. Uh, and that, uh, you know, it was a dominant part, one party dominant uh, political system, uh, party system. Um, but that whole system collapsed in a major corrup corruption scandal in the 90s. Um, and then the entire sort of political uh, elite that existed until then basically was removed and new parties arose. And since then, you've had some major parties, but um, um, or, or sort of uh, orientations or groups or um, uh, of um, ideological or different ideological orientation that have kind of remained in the same general position, but with different names and with different compositions and so on. So you would have uh, since '90s, you have a center right, mostly dominated by Forza Italia, which then faded away and a center-left mostly dominated by a variety, under different names, by some sort of a social democratic party. But as I said, within this you have many other uh, more fringe parties, uh, and within this you have different party names, different coalitions, but kind of the direction being you know, center-left, center-right, more to the right and more to the left, but in the middle you have two, two major forces, more or less. Uh, but fluidity, parties always form uh, you know, um, uh, members of parties break away, uh, and this is why you know uh, uh, governments change and form. Uh, because in order to have, the, Italy is a parliamentary system, so the way it works is that <clears throat> each government is formed based on the majority uh, that that is formed in the in the parliament, in the lower and in the upper house. Because Italy has a balanced uh, bicameral system in which the chamber of deputies. Uh, the lower house is uh, uh, of equal uh, importance and power as the upper house, which is the Senate. Uh, it's a fairly rare uh, arrangement and perhaps not the healthiest one, um, which means that you have to have a majority in both houses in order to have a, a, a cabinet, yeah, in order to be able to form a cabinet, because both houses need to um, uh, approve the cabinet, the, the executive, the government. Uh, so, because of this fragmentation and constant fluidity uh, within Italian politics, uh, the constellation of parties in the, and alliances in the Chamber of Deputies or the Senate continuously changes. And they have tried to, to sort of play with the electoral system so that uh, more stable majorities would form in the lower and in the upper house so that you didn't, you know, you didn't have to change uh, cabinets so often. Because uh, uh, change cabinet so often, but um, it only partially succeeded, and so on. So, uh, but that's kind of the context, right? So, so here's the um, <coughs> um, res here are the results of the of the elections in uh, 2018 uh, when they have moved to yet another uh, electoral system. Um, there used to be one. The previous one was before 2018 was. Um, one in which whichever party gained a plurality, which is most, but not the majority, of the votes nationally, uh, they would get a, a, a sort of an artificial majority of seats in the lower house, right? So if, let's say, uh, the Democratic Party obtains uh, uh, like 40%, which is not a majority, uh, but more than all the other parties, it will automatically get more than 50% of the seats, 40% of the votes if they're more than all the other parties, any of the other individual other parties or coalitions, then they will get an artificial majority of, um, um, uh, of seats in the, in the lower house. That should have solved the problem, but yet it did not because in the Senate it didn't work this way because there, there because the Senate is supposed to represent the regions, it was each party or coalition that got a plurality in each region of Italy because Italy is, is a unitary state, but it has a sort of, it's highly decentralized and it sort of has inclinations towards federalism. In fact, many demand federalism, as we will see. Uh, and I, if you ask me, it should be more federal. 
uh, sort of naturally speaking, in terms of its composition, culturally uh, and societally. But the point is that in the upper house, uh, the Senate, in each region, each party or coalition that get that got the plurality, they got an artificial majority of the seats from that region. But that did not add up to an artificial majority in the Senate. And since both houses need to approve a given cabinet, one party would always have a majority in the lower house because of this electoral system, but not in the upper house. Whatever. <laughs> but they changed it, but not into, if you ask me, into a better system. They changed it to, into, a vari into a variation of a system that I, I'm very fond of, which is called mixed member proportional representation, which I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. <coughs> uh, if you've heard me talk about it before, um, but it, in which, which is the German system basically, but it's not quite the German system, but it's a variation of it, a variation that I don't like. Uh, again, we're not gonna, we can perhaps talk one day about um, just electoral systems because they're fun and so important. But um, in this case, uh, so if you look at this chart, if you if you're really confused, it's fine, right? Because uh, it's easy to explain once you get the electoral system, but I don't want you to spend much time on it. Um, the point of, with the mixed member proportional representation system, or whatever variation they use of it, <clears throat> is that it doesn't necessarily give you artificial majorities. So if the problem in, uh, in, in the politics of a specific country is fragmentation, right? A system that is based on pure proportionality, right? Uh, in which the number of votes received by each party, the proportion of votes is reflected propor uh, it's reflected exactly in the number of seats it, it obtains in the, in the parliament, right? That's proportionality. So if you get 30% of the votes, you get 30% of the seats. Now, for many people, this is normality. Not for Americans, for example, or for, for English or Canadians and so on, for British or Canadians, where the system is, is completely different. That, that proportion of... Uh, votes received by each party does not reflect in the proportion of seats um, obtained in the in the parliament because in these countries that I gave an example, the system is majoritarian. You vote for an individual, and whoever whichever individual wins that district, they win that one seat. That overall results in a system in which parties can get the same almost the same number of proportion of votes overall in the country, but because it's based on individuals winning seats. Uh, two parties with the same proportion, almost the same proportion, or the same proportion of votes, can get radically different proportion of seats because again, the idea is winning individual seats. Let's not go into further details. The point is that uh, there is there are two major ways of of transforming votes into seats. One is proportionally, in which the percentage of seats, the percentage of votes trans transfers into the same percentage of seats. Uh, and one is majoritarian, right, in which there is no direct connection between the proportion of votes received, the, the statistically the, the percentage of votes received, and the percentage of seats, because there each individual candidate fights for their one specific seat. Um, now, in a country that is highly fragmented uh, politically, right, like Italy or France, France in, uh, in as I'm talking about political culture, a proportion, a pure proportional representation system, yeah, in which the percentage of votes uh, translates into the same percentage of seats will create political fragmentation also in the parliament, which is nice because it's democratic, but it's not nice when you need to form a government because to form a government you need to have a, ma a clear majority. The other system, the majoritarian system, always creates clear majorities, or most of the time creates clear majorities, right, because it forces an artificial majority. So my point here is that that we're moving to this MMPR, uh, mixed member proportional representation system, um, electoral system, it didn't solve the problem, obviously. Uh, so 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 now you have, you know, having a fragmented pol um, sort of political culture also gives you a fragmented um, parliament, yeah, and that will create the same problems as we have talked about. So. This MMPR that they have doesn't seem like a solution, which is why I don't like it. Although I, I usually like this electoral system for other reasons. Um, so if you look here, uh, so let's look at the, these results. Um, so in order to, to understand 
sort of who are the main actors in Italian politics, uh, where were they, uh, what is their characteristic, and um, how did these actors get to forming this specific government that they formed just now. Uh, because you need to understand the nature of these parties to kind of see how unique, though, this government that just formed is. Yeah? So uh, you see that uh, in the 2018 election, uh, there, were, um, there was a large center-right coalition, yeah? basically different parties and co coalitions of parties on the right sort of uh, running together. Um, and different major parties on the left and coalitions of parties. And... Yeah, so and this party here, which I mentioned with the five star movement, um, and some other uh, smaller parties, which shouldn't concern us much. <clears throat> of these, the major actors in today's uh, Italian politics are uh, Lega, La Lega, uh, the League. And let's, let's look at each of these parties, each of these actors. La Liga, La Lega, or uh, League actually was called, it's still called, I think, formally the Northern League. It, was, uh, it came about as a sort of regionalist, um, feder um, federalist party, meaning a party that wanted um, to push towards a, a federal, uh, or more federal uh, Italy, or a federal Italy, because it's not federal, it's unitary, uh, meaning um, that it wanted more autonomy and more self-determination for the northern part, the northern league, yeah? which is the more developed part of Italy, against what? The southern part of Italy. And the rhetoric being that the the north is, is the, are the diligent people uh, who, who make the money while the south, the south only gets subventions from the money of the north. Um, but this has to do with, uh, as I said, Italy as a society and as a culture and, you know, and its history. Um, because uh, <clears throat> Italy is a um, highly fragmented uh, country, not only uh, politically, but also in terms of its, its uh, culture and its society. And it has to do with the fact of how Italy was formed as a state, the unification of Italy, because if you know your history, you know that until the unification of Italy in late 19th century, what today we call Italy never existed. Yeah, It never existed. What existed were city-states and smaller states, right? So Florence was a city-state, Siena was a city-state, there were the Papal States, there was, um, you know, the Kingdom of Sicily. So you had, uh, just like in ancient Greece, you had um, these um, uh, states, smaller states and city-states throughout, you know, uh, well, let's say at least since, you know, the, the Middle Ages, uh, early Middle Ages, right, after the fall of the Roman Empire, yeah? Well, there was the Roman Empire, but that was something else. And that's not the same as Italy, uh, obviously. <laughs> and um, so there's... So when Italy was, was, was unified by force, yeah, but also the will of some people yeah, in the late 19th century, well, it doesn't mean that these cultural differences and, and societal differences that have developed over history, they have disappeared overnight. Yeah? Uh, there are different dialects, there are different cultures, uh, and so on, and traditions, and so on. So that kind of explains this push towards federalism and why I said that I would, you know, if you ask me, I would, I would, I would uh, say that a, a federal organization of um, Italy as a state, meaning uh, a state composed of uh, regions that have a significant degree of self-determination um, and sovereignty, uh, would fit more than the current unitary form. But that's another discussion. But the Liga, Lega, Lega, this is how it came about. Now then, <coughs> it, um, as, it, as, the, as, uh, as Forza Italia, which used to be the main party on the right, uh, since the 90s decayed, the Liga uh, grew, La Lega grew, and um, it's sort of, when you grow, right, you need to have space to grow. You need to have sort of uh, vote, votes and voters to attract. Uh, and in order to do that, you can't be just a regionalist party, hence the name, change in name, right? Uh, if you just say Northern League, then how are you going to get votes in the South? <laughs> and you also need to change a little bit your rhetoric. So what La Lega is, or was until very recently, meaning to like this year, is, let's say, a right-wing party, um, which now moved from a, from a regionalist rhetoric to a sovereignist rhetoric, which is basically Euro-skeptic, EU-skeptic rhetoric, more sovereignty for Italy itself, 
it's an anti-immigrant party. So it's uh, uh, it's not really center right, but it's more to the right uh, party, which I'm not using as a bad name. Yeah, right or left are just political directions, um, and and it. Obviously, it is now, the, as you can see from the results, it is the largest party on the, on the right. But it has its limitations due to, you know, this rhetoric that is perceived a little bit, you know, uh, extreme by some, uh, including, uh, and, and, you know, its leader, and because of its leader who kind of embodies this rhetoric, Matteo Salvini. Now, the next party on the right is Forza Italia. As I said, this was the major party on the center-right for about a good 10, 15 years after the 90s. This is famously the party established by Silvio Berlusconi that had its heyday in the 90s and early 2000s, and then it decayed. Uh, it split into other parties, um, <coughs> including one of the next parties on the list, Brothers of Italy. It changed its name, uh, Pop it was Popolo della Libertà, the People of Liberty, for a while, and then it renamed itself Forza Italia, but it's no longer the, that Forza Italia, so it's a much smaller party. It used to be the sort of a big catch-all umbrella party on the center-right, which also made it so successful. Remember Berlusconi, uh, no matter what you think of him as a figure, was, was one of the longest-lasting and stablest uh, prime minister, uh, you know, that managed to govern Italy after World War II, which is a feat. Um, so that's, that's Forza Italia, so it's sort of a recomposed uh, center-right, but still Berlusconi is the major figure there. Uh, he's 80-something, but still he's the, sort of the, the major figure in that party, which is also one of the problems of Forza Italia, because many people will not vote for it because of Berlusconi. Then you have Brothers of Italy, which is a splinter from Forza Italia, and it's sort of perhaps even for, uh, further right than Lega, uh, along the same sort of narratives, but even more forcefully Eurosceptic and uh, sovereignist. And uh, I, would, I would compare it with uh, perhaps um, uh, um, uh, uh, Rassemblement, uh, what is it? Rassemblement National, um, the, the Front National, uh, Reformed Front National. Uh, Front National being the party of uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, but I'm not comparing it to that, but sort of with the f um, uh, Front National of, of his, um, well, his daughter, Marie, uh, Marianne, Marianne Le Pen, um, in, Fran in France, um, if you are at all familiar with, with, with that. Um, Front National was sort of an extreme right party under Jean-Marie Le Pen, but on, under, uh, what is it, Marine, Marine Le Pen, um, it sort of moved to the center and changed its name. It's called Rassemblement National, which is National Rally. So I would compare it with the reformed sort of to the right, but also not f fringe, uh, but more, you know, mainstream, a little bit more mainstream uh, party, uh, Brothers of Italy. Uh, its leader is also a woman, uh, just like in the case of Rassemblement National, it's uh, Giorgia Meloni. And then there's... Um, another uh, party, or uh, actually it's an, another alliance on the right, which we shouldn't concern ourselves. Now, let's look at the numbers here, the, the seats. You notice that together, um, this uh, center-right coalition obtained 265 seats, which is a lot from a parliament of 630. Yeah? Uh, it's not a majority, though. Uh, it is not uh, the, the majority. Uh, and <laughs> that's a problem, isn't it? Um, and among the parties on the right, the largest, as you saw, uh, in the, on the right is uh, Lega. Then let's move to the left. So there's a center-left coalition, the Democratic Party. This is basically, as I said, sort of the major center-left uh, social democratic party. But it's a, here it's basically social democracy and actually Christian democracy. Because, you know, uh, Christian democracy, the Christian Democratic Party that dominated <coughs> Italian politics... Uh, after World War II, for about 50 years, it had it was a gigantic party. It had, you know, center right. It had center left uh, uh, dimensions and uh, orientations within. So, in the Democratic Party, we'll find people from f former, basically, social democrats, but also from sort of a more center left Christian democrats. Uh, it's a it's a it's a sort of a catch all umbrella party uh, PD. Uh, and it's the inheritor of other center-left parties that have been a staple of, of post-1990 um, Italian politics. 
uh, under different names, Lulivo, different uh, like the olive tree, uh, what was it, the daisy, all kinds of names and coalitions. <clears throat> but it's a stable sort of feature of, of Italian politics since the 90s, a sort of a major centralist party. As you notice, they got uh, a good number of seats, um, 112, um, although lost significantly compared to, to um, the previous elections of 2013. Notice here also how La Lega grew tremendously, gigantically, between 2013 and 2018, yeah, between the two elections. <clears throat> And then you have another party, more Europe, together, whatever. The other parties on the left, besides PD, on this left, center-left coalition, are not very relevant. Their parties or alliances of parties note, note that they have not obtained, they did not obtain significant amounts of votes. So on the center-left, what you really have mainly is the Democratic Party. But you have all these splinter parties, as I mentioned. Good. And now we get to the fun part. Now we get to the five-star movement. And I did link also um, uh, in the, in, on the blog, actually links to previous, some previous blog entries which document the rise of the Five Star Movement. And why Five, five Star Movement is interesting, and clearly the name always says, says something, right? So, uh, you know, Forza Italia, Brothers of Italy, yeah, kind of tells you. Brothers of Italy actually is from the first lines of the Italian anthem, so you kind of get the sense of, you know, the nationalist patriotic rhetoric of that party. Now, five-star movement means nothing, right? Uh, which can tell you that, you know, you always, it's good to start from the name to kind of under, uh, try to understand whether or not this reflects a, a specific um, um, ideological orientation. So, <clears throat> the five-star movement arose, briefly uh, explained, arose, um, it's a populist movement. And this is why it's fascinating, because it's probably the most um, Movement. Well, at least in the West, yeah, uh, which includes the United States, Canada, and Western Europe, and Europe as such, uh, that arose after the 2008-2009 economic crisis. And we, uh, I, I talked, we talked a little bit about about populist movements. I think uh, in the first episode of the podcast when we talked about the current state of American politics and the recent crisis uh, in the American in American politics. Um, but the point of uh, populist movements is that they emerge, they uh, rise, they arise as a result of major crises, usually economic crises, as a, as, as a result of the rage of the population uh, at sort of the failure of the existing elite on handling the crisis, right? When people get really hit, really, really hit, uh, they need to direct their anger and they direct it towards whatever, whoever is in charge, but the entire system that is, that is in charge. And uh, the strength and, 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 uh, of the populist parties or movements come from the fact that they are fueled by real energy, right? This energy of rage, of revolt, of throw the bums out. Now, in the US, this is the Tea Party, this is the Occupy movement, this is the movements that were rioting last summer. They're all populist movements um, or, or populist yeah, outbursts. Um, but if not all, many of them. It's a sort of, you know, let's reject the entire establishment, change the entire thing. Um, but as I said, Five Star Movement might be the most successful uh, such populist movement or party in, in the West overall. It probably is. Because it arose uh, sometime before the 2013 election, as, as I said, I did link some articles detailing those elections and the rise of this movement, so I'm not going to go in deep detail in, on it, but into it. But what I want to say is that um, it also has um, features of other um, populist sort of movements or um, uh, trends that have been developing since um, late 90s, early 2000s. Again, I mentioned this in the first episode about this rise of populist uh, movements. And I'm referring here specifically to the famous uh, pirate parties that emerged in uh, basically early 2000s and had some modicum of minor successes in Western Europe in, uh, <coughs> and in Northern Europe. Uh, and part of pirate parties which were basically, the pirate part was referring to the internet piracy, right? And internet piracy as an as a, as a embodiment or reflection <coughs> or expression of sort of um, 
digital freedom, yeah, of, of internet freedom, of the freedom and sort of this horizontal uh, universe that exists on the internet, right? So, so, so the fact that we can do whatever we want and it's all horizontal and you're all equal, right? So that's kind of the, 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 the idea and the message and the way these pirate parties, what the pirate parties kind of embodied. And I'm saying that the uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle, the Five Star Movement, M5S um, resembles that because it also adopted part of that. Because what you've been seeing, what we've been seeing since uh, the 2000s has, has also been, um, one, of the, one of the things that we've been seeing has been um, the you know, rise of populism, but also the increase uh, in uh, uh, these, the number and the spread of these initiatives towards direct democracy. Yeah? So what is direct democracy? Um, as I mentioned a couple of episodes ago, um, direct democracy is significantly different from what we have as the established political systems of the you know, Western world since the 19th century. What we have is representative democracy, right? In which we elect representatives who then make laws to govern us. Yeah? And this is what we call democracy, but it's not actually democracy in the traditional sort of classical Greek, ancient Greek sense. But it's, it's, it's a new type of democracy, it's representative democracy. Now, what the Greeks had and what they called democracy and what Plato and Aristotle and most thinkers until literally, well, forever, called one of the worst political systems possible, yeah, democracy, which they called the worst, one of the worst political systems possible. So why did they call democracy the worst political system possible? Because what they understood by democracy was direct democracy, in which the entire population basically gets together, the entire citizenry gets together to pass laws uh, <coughs> and to, um, uh, uh, to, to pass laws and to um, um, uh, the, take, take policy decisions. And why is this bad? Because that's basically a rule by mob. And the rule by mob is very uh, dangerous uh, and very prone to sort of impulse and not reason, right? Because the mob doesn't act according to reason, to rationality, but it is easily swayed by some, uh, you know, rhetoricians, uh, and it does not act according to, you know, uh, cool judgment. Yeah? So, for example, the founding fathers of the United States, those who wrote the Constitution, knew this very well. This is why the system that they created and put together was one that tried to avoid being direct democracy, because the idea is to filter the, sort of the impulses and, and the rage of the mob and, uh, through, uh, through representation, and to hopefully send representatives who are better prepared, more cool-headed, and whatever. Point being that direct democracy was never considered to be a good system, yeah? But, you know, when you, when you say democracy, we have this idea of rule by the people and whatever, right? It's not ruled by the people, again, it's ruled by representatives. But we have this ingrained and this idea that, well, if, it ha what, if what the people happens, what the people who really want happens, then it will be good, yeah? Well, again, we forget that when we say the people, we don't think individuals, we think the masses, and what the masses want, not necessarily good, yeah? Um, because again, mobs do not act rationally, individuals do, uh, generally speaking. Uh, but there has been this impulse because, you know, every system, even if it works, uh, you know, has, has problems. And, and we're always dissatisfied and, and, uh, with, with what there is because there is no perfection on earth. Uh, so we want it to be even better. And because we live in this paradigm, the liberal paradigm established, you know, 200 years ago, um, in which, of which democracy as a concept and as an idea is a part, you know, one of the ways in which this sort of inherent dissatisfaction with the state of the world has manifested itself, in, especially in the last 25 years, has been as a push towards direct democracy. Now, with the advent of the internet, direct democracy suddenly seemed even more possible uh, because, hey, here's a, here's a platform that is level, that is, where, that is horizontal, where everybody is the same, and there is no dif differentiation. How is that good? Whatever. Um, and it's, uh, it's also a platform that can make it easy for all of us to, to give our opinion on things. So a platform to manifest and leave out that direct democracy, because, you know, in ancient Greece, maybe 30,000 people or whatever, 
in a city state maybe you could gather all the citizens together or you know most of them or a part of them nowadays with 20 30 million you can gather all of them together right but the internet suddenly makes this possible okay movimento cinco stelle is a party that came about and is built on this direct democracy model so much so that when it was formed, when they decided whom to run as candidates for the first election in 2013, it was all done online. So when you're a member of, uh, they have this plat platform called Rousseau, yeah, it also tells you about where this idea of direct democracy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, goes back to. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, let me put it this way. Um, well, there's a lot to be said about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, both positive, but a lot of it negative as well. But anyway, um, so the Rousseau platform, where all the members, yeah, basically become uh, 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 the decision makers within the party. That's the idea, right? Uh, and and so when they decided whom to select to to run for for office in 2013, these people were elected completely online by these members through this platform, yeah. Um, <laughs> So much so that that you know the leader of the party, the, the one that generated the party, a, a stand-up comedian called Beppe Grillo. Again, there's more to be said here. Read that commentary I have from a previous blog entry. Uh, so Beppe Grillo, who could not run for some you know uh, uh, problems he has he said in the past, um, he said that you know he doesn't know all the candidates because the candidates were you know this sort of a bottom-up elected through this sort of a bottom-up structure of direct democracy. Online. So I'm saying M M5S is a fascinating, fascinating phenomenon. First of all, because it has been tremendously successful and because it combines all these populist um, uh, impulses that have been around in the last two decades. Direct democracy, internet democracy, <coughs> the populist revolt uh, increased by the crisis of 2008-2009 and so on. All of this into one thing. In a context in which the dissatisfaction with the political elite, with the status quo, is sort of a feature of politics. I'm talking about Italy, in which you know politicians and the whole political strata, the whole political class, is despised by, by a good part of the population. Yeah, so it's a it's a it's a perfect constellation for such a populist party to not just arise but to have tremendous tremendous success, because if you look at the election results. Um, in uh, uh, that we just uh, looked at. This is, you know, uh, the single largest party still in the Italian parliament. Yeah, 227 seats. As a, as a single party, it's the largest party. Now, these center-right coalitions together, all those parties have like 40 more <coughs> seats. Uh, and the center-left has half. While this one party, Five Star Movement, has 227 seats. So the three major forces are center-right, center-left, and Movimento Cinque Stelle. But Movimento Cinque Stelle came about as a protest and in rejection of, of everything. So suddenly, normally, it should not, yeah, it should not be uh, uh, available to enter into coalitions with any of the other forces, right? Because that's the whole logic. <coughs> but remember, this is a 2018 election. And even... In the two, uh, uh, so, so um, this is the 2018 election. So, Movimento Cinque Stelle entered the parliament in 2013. So, since then, it has been, you know, it entered once it entered the political arena, yeah, of you know that of representative democracies. It suddenly realized, as with all these populist forces, that. There are certain rules, or 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 there's a logic to to uh, the system of representation that you either play, become part of that logic, or you have no say. Yeah, um, <laughs> which right? And the logic of you know this representative system is that the point of it, right? As I mentioned a couple of episodes ago, is that the different opinions from the population are sense to be represented in the parliament uh, because conflict of opinion in the population is inevitable but instead of fighting each other in the population we send representatives to fight it out there uh, in a civilized manner according to rules and to find solutions together finding solutions together means form 
reaching compromise and forming majorities yeah, in the parliament that can pass decision. Because the logic of decision making in the parliament is that you need a majority, 50% plus one. Yeah, that's majority. Not plurality, which is you know, more than others, but more than half. Yeah? Now, so it's inherent in the whole logic of modern democracy, of, uh, of representative democracy, is that compromise, without compromise, there cannot be government, governance. Right? Because we will never agree on everything, the people in the population, it's our fault. <coughs> so in order to reach some path of common action in the parliament, they need to combine these disagreements from the population and, you know, compromise here, compromise there, but find something that is the achievable good. Uh, you know, people call politics the art of the possible, yeah? Which is wonderful, because you have this context in which you have all these other people, all these other opinions, all, all these obstacles, and yet you try to achieve the... You have a goal, but you're not going to be able to achieve it perfectly, but you try to, to get as close as possible, so the art of the possible. Point being that the moment the Cinque Stelle arose as a populist revolt against the status quo, throw the bombs out, that was their slogan, with other words. But then it gets into the parliament where, in order for it to do anything, it needs to play along, which is the, always the problem of populist movements, because their strength comes from the rage that is behind it, right? And the, the mass popular emotions behind it. The weakness is that it doesn't, it has the energy, but it doesn't know where to go. This is why actually Five Star Movement has a hodgepodge of, of, of you know, it's a populist movement, but it has sort of, you know, ecology is important, but also is anti-immigration, but it's also with, with, you know, with Europe is half-half, and it's afraid of, you know, the big capital. It's, it's a hodgepodge of things, and it's, it's also moving back and forth, because again, it's easy to decide that we're all angry at something, but when it comes to solutions, we're going to discover that each of us has a different solution. The anger is common, the solutions will be different, yeah? So Five Star Movement is in, in the process of, and it has been since the beginning, this is why it's a fascinating case study, of, of, of living all of these things out. Both the success of being fueled by rage and the conundrum of, well, what, what now? Now that we are successful because we need to work with others. And, and if we start working with others, then a part of our supporters will leave us because, well, we want all the others' bombs thrown out. What do you mean you're working with, with them? So what happens after the 2018 election? Uh, now that we had a review of the major actors uh, there. Uh, so clearly there's no, not one force who has a majority. Uh, so you either, um, so, and, and these forces center and center right on their own cannot govern. Together they don't want to govern, so what? Now, Italy is a parliamentary system. In a parliamentary system, the, most, uh, the only um, body that is directly elected is the parliament. One chamber, two chambers, depending. And then the parliament basically creates the government, the cabinet led by a prime minister. But there's also a, a head of... The prime minister who is the head of government. But there's also a head of state in parliamentary systems. The UK is a parliamentary system, and the, uh, the head of state there, obviously, is the monarch, the queen. Uh, Germany is a parliamentary system. The head of state there is a president that you never hear about, of course, because the most important politically powerful person in parliamentary systems is the head of the government, the head of the cabinet, which is the prime minister. In Germany, the prime minister is called chancellor. It doesn't matter. It's the same position, right? So the dynamic of parliamentary systems make the prime minister the most powerful person if they have a strong majority in the parliament, which in the UK, Germany usually happens. Italy, however, as you see, it doesn't, which makes Italy another interesting case study from the point of view that it's a parliamentary system with nominally a weak president because the president as a head of state has only representative roles, symbolic ceremonial roles, signs, cannot veto anything, just signs things, represents Italy, it sort of stands for the Italy as a state but doesn't have any actual political governmental power, normally. But in a situation in which you don't have <coughs> stable majorities in parliament, almost never, suddenly the president, who's going to solve the situation? Because these parties cannot get along, cannot agree. So you need a political actor to step in. And power doesn't like a void. 
So the president in Italy has become a much more powerful and influential uh, 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 position uh, or role that it would normally should be or would be uh, in a parliamentary system. Because the, presidents need to, the president needs to step in and to, uh, almost after every election, and to guide and to lead this process of finding uh, uh, a, a manageable a governing coalition uh, in, the, in the parliament. Uh, so, so that's what the president did then. In fact, the president stayed, um, uh, well, then did the same thing in 2013 and so on. It's almost always the same because the parties can't agree. Anyway, so what resulted from uh, after this, this election was an unnatural coalition, if you can believe it, between the Five Star Movement yeah, and La Lega and the League, which is basically right-wing party with this sort of a populist throw the bums out, more left, but combination of other things, party. The, the I mean, parties that normally literally are, are at, at loggerheads, I mean, are, are at loggerheads with each, with each other. I almost said that the opposite parts of the spectrum, ends of the spectrum, almost, almost, in a, in a way on certain issues. Um, so an unnatural coalition, but why? Because, you know, they agreed, okay, we're going to do, La Lega said, we need this and this and this, uh, M5S said, we need this and this and this, you get this position, I get this position, as long as we can obtain each of us what we want on these specific issues, and we get these positions in the, in the cabinet, we can have a governing coalition, but clearly unnatural. Well, unsurprisingly, it didn't last long, and then <clears throat> another coalition was formed, so the first uh, prime minister was, uh, after 2018, was uh, Giuseppe Conte. And Conte is from the Five Star Movement. There's never been a politician before joining the Five Star Movement. But, uh, so he came in um, as, the, as the prime minister. So that was the Conte, first Conte government. Then this coalition falls apart, which was to be expected, because La Lega withdrew support, because, you know, they still didn't hate each other, the two, the two movements and parties. And then another governing coalition was formed between uh, the Democratic Party, uh, Central Left, and the Five Star Movement, again with Conte as Prime Minister. You see, changing government, uh, let's not misunderstand it, it doesn't always mean that you will change everyone in the government. Yeah? So it just means that you change the uh, governing coalition, or a significant number of ministers, or just the Prime Minister, whatever. But that too also doesn't last long, because, well, the Central Left is also fragmented, and one of the... Uh, so while, and the majority they had wasn't tremendous, if you, if you look at it, 300, what, 49 or something, if all the center-left coalition would participate, right? And in the upper house, which is where it happened, in the Senate, uh, the, their majority was even uh, slimmer. Uh, the Senate has 315, uh, and if you look together, if we would put them all together, five-star and center-left would have 172. Uh, but again... Doesn't mean that all of those on center left joined this Conte to government uh, coalition. So what happened after uh, after a while was that a, a faction of the Democratic Party split uh, under Matteo Renzi. Matteo Renzi who used to be, who, who was previously uh, prime minister uh, from the Democratic Party. He split from the Democratic Party. As I said, these fluctuations are continued, continuous and major figures from various parties split and formed their own little party and he formed his own party I think called Italia Viva uh, Living Italy the point is that with the split of Renzi the, the Conte government the second Conte government uh, also fell because suddenly they did not have a majority I think in the upper house if I, if I remember uh, correctly so that happened at the end of the of the year um, uh, last year last year um, so so last year um, with this moving uh, movement of Renzi out of the Conte uh, government for specific uh, uh, you know issues uh, political issues and uh, governmental issues um, suddenly again you didn't have a majority so what do you do because you've tried five star with the right with the La Lega didn't work out. Five Star would not work with Forza Italia. This is why Forza Italia was not part of the previous 
Conte won government. Why? Because of Berlusconi and Five Star Movement is the anti-system party. Now what would happen if the, the anti-system party would enter into a coalition with the person who used to be the old system, Berlusconi, right? I mean, it would crumble. It would fall apart. Uh, everybody would leave the party. Five Star Movement. So, so, so you tried that, it, that fell. Now you tried uh, Five Star Movement and Center Left, it also fell. So what now? But what now? They would find something, you know. <clears throat> but this sort of a normal political instability, let's call it that way, that is not atypical for Italian politics. If this wouldn't have happened within the context of everything we've been talking about, in the, in the middle of a pandemic that has hit most gravely Italy, yeah, and has had tremendous uh, economic, uh, negative economic effects on a country that had a limping economy, high public debt, deficit, whatever, yeah? Right? If it wouldn't have happened then, and in the context in which the EU has passed this huge package, which is a huge opportunity in which Italy will get the most money of all the individual member states, the, high, the high, largest sum uh, among the uh, member states, if all of these would not be there, some solutions would have been found, whatever, I don't know what. I mean, I have some ideas. But clearly this now is, is a situation that in Italy is lived, rightly so, as a war situation. So we're in the middle of World War III, that is the pandemic, because it, Italy truly was hit, you know, uh, as hard as that. And it is perceived as that. And there are, all, there are all these parallels to, to actual World War II and what happened in Italy after World War II. Well, what happened in Italy after World War II? What happened was an Italian miracle, Italian economic miracle, so-called. Because Italy rose from the ashes and from the rubbles and became a, a, a prosperous state. As I said, you know, with all the problems that it always had, Italy is one of the largest economies in the world, uh, one of the most prosperous countries in the world in many ways. Um, so, so... You know, that was the result of something. But why would that was possible is because after World War II, people and parties and political forces came together and used the, the tremendous sources, resources of the Marshall Plan to create this Italian economic miracle. And this has also been done at other points because what's interesting about Italy, you know, as I said, um, there's nothing to, you know, with all these interesting and fascinating problems that Italy always manifests, like, um, you know, typically um, fairly dysfunctional administration in terms of state administration, corruption, uh, organized crime at different points, um, you know, the, 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 the dark, the black uh, and gray economy that doesn't pay taxes, um, uh, a median income that is not high. Like when I was, uh, you know, spent time in Italy in mid-2000s, the middle, the median income, like the, well, the, 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 the um, median income, I would guess, I guess it used to be, um, I don't know, 1,500, um, 1500 euros or 1,200 euros, in, which is what? $1,500, basically. If that is the, the income of, of the, the median income, the income in, in, the, in the economy, uh, in the conditions in which the prices are, were not lower than elsewhere, but higher, actually, you can, if most people, this is what they earn, well, you realize that they're not rich, yeah, like the most most people. Uh, there's a lot of high unemployment, especially youth unemployment. However, at the same time, Italy, you know, the most culturally rich country in the world, bar not. <laughs> there's no question about it. Culture, uh, which includes not just architecture and history and art, but also, you know, lifestyle, right? Uh, from food to drinks to wine and so on. It has one of the highest life expectancy in the world. Uh, so they know how to live um, and make do. Uh, as I said, it, in specific uh, areas of, of the economy, they are world leaders, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, crafts, um, uh, boutique, you know, uh, things in, from, from design to, you know, clothes to, to, to furniture to, to cars, right? So, um, and some of the large, big, you know, world-leading firms are Italian. So you have a combination, you know, uh, of, of all these factors, while you also have huge inequalities within the Italian regions, all of this is part of it, yeah? Huge strengths and also tremendous systemic weaknesses and problems, yeah? 
but with the pandemic and the economic crisis, it was the weaknesses that came to the fore and, and, and the dangers that came to the fore. This is why Italy is in a state of, you know, as if it were in the middle of a war, because it is. And, and this is the context in which, um, with the threat of the crisis and the promise of the, of the potential of development with the next generation EU package, and the political crisis that created this opportunity, the solution found, and here's, here we get to the new Italian government, by whom? By the president, right? Because it's the president who's going to step in because there's no one else. You know, in a way, doing more than he would have to do or would be called to do according to his position. The solution found by him was to create, uh, to, call to, uh, to call to arms, so to speak, uh, a person call, uh, called Mario Draghi, who is not part of any of the political parties, yeah? Uh, so we would call him, what, a specialist, right? Uh, and he's an economist. So he's a specialist. We call him uh, these kind of people who are called in to govern, although not part of the political parties, but they're called in to govern because of their specialized uh, technical knowledge, so to speak. We call them technocrats, yeah? Because their power, kratos, yeah, comes from their technical knowledge, from their specific specialized professional knowledge, technocrat, yeah? This is what gives them power. Now, Italy has had technocratic governments before, and sometimes in the heart of, of, of crisis or when things need to be done, <coughs> for example, um, early 2000s, when Italy was, when the euro was being adopted, Italy was in no shape <laughs> <laughs> to adopt the euro because there are very stringent conditions that need to be met with deficit and whatever. And yet, with a technocratic government and, and some very in, uh, sort of uh, uh, intelligent and adept people, uh, they, um, uh, they managed to actually uh, adopt uh, the measures that led to the Italian economy being prepared to adopt the euro. Uh, so, um, so, you know, when need be, they have, when the need arises, they have the resources, intellectual, uh, know-how capacity to get things done. And truly, they do have this. Truly, they do have this. Um, because there, there are some tremendous uh, minds uh, in Italy, it has, as it has been proven over and over again, especially uh, in other forums, for example, at European level or uh, at, at the head of... Uh, various uh, international institutions. And that's exactly uh, what happened now, because Mario Draghi, Mario Draghi uh, comes with a huge reputation, but the reputation mostly built, but also in Italy, uh, you know, he, um, as I said, not a political figure, but has been the governor of the Bank of Italy. Um, uh, he has uh, been, um, uh, uh, you know, a scholar. Uh, he has been a scholar not just in Italy, but also uh, in the U.S., uh, I think he was. He went through. He he was a you know a fellow at Harvard, the Brookings Institution. Was the head of uh, some uh, vice president of Goldman Sachs uh, investment fund, and then came back to 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 Europe and uh, was the head of a sort of a stability fund uh, or forum of all the central banks of of the European of the EU's member states. And then in 2011, I think it was, he was elected head of the European Central Bank, which is one of the key institutions of uh, Europe. And he was elected right when the euro crisis hit in 2013-ish. And he was the one that rescued the euro. euro. He was um, this famous quote then, um, you know, that we are ready to do whatever it takes, sort of a, this whatever it takes. And that quote from the head of the Central, European Central Bank sort of stimulated all the markets to, to, to sort of support the, 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 the euro because there was will behind it. So he was, he was celebrated as the rescuer of the, of the euro, one of the brightest minds in the country. Point is, huge um, reputation, um, clear know-how in the economy, Clear ability to solve a crisis. The euro crisis was the endangering the entire EU project. He, as the head of ECB, is credited with saving the euro. A reputation mostly built outside, uh, internationally, as I said, not part of uh, in, in Italian, uh, uh, you know, uh, intra-Italian uh, uh, politics. This is the guy who, who Mattarella, the president, 
<coughs> uh, asked to form the new government. And as I said, this is an important, all of this, uh, these elements of his profile are important because, the, as you, you see, they respond to the specific profile of the crisis uh, itself as well. Um, it's an economic crisis, but it's also a developmental crisis. He's called to, um, to create a program that would uh, not just solve, like, fireman style, the immediate, uh, uh, you know, uh, a crisis, but also to rebuild, redesign Italy and its economy and various structures within Italy with a view to the future. This is why also he accepted, he accepted immediately. And we're going to talk in a second about he, what he proposes to do his program. We'll see that this is also how he looks. But let's, let's, let's roll back. He's a technocrat. And being a technocrat and not part of a political party means that he doesn't have party support, ingrained party support, right? Uh, the point of, you know, having a majority in the parliament, or meaning parties party coalition that support the Prime Minister means that the, that Prime Minister can propose um, policies that he knows the Parliament will pass. Now, when you have technocrats, they don't have any guaranteed support because they are not members of any of the parties in Parliament. So whether or not the parties support them uh, is up to them. And what usually happens with technocratic government is that their strength is their sort of capacity and ability. Their weakness is, is their political weakness. Yeah. We've seen, though, that when the Italy needed to join the Euro, a technocratic government, um, I think it was Monti, Prime Minister, uh, solved the situation. But it didn't last long. So the problem with, with technocratic uh, government is that they usually are uh, temporary solutions because someone needs to run the government. Uh, but now it's not about running the government, it's about redesigning Italy. It's about creating a plan for not just recovery, but redevelopment for development with a view to the future. So that's what makes this government very, very curious. Not just this, but the solution that was found, because the solution that was found was, okay, so are we going to go with all technocratic government? Is that going to last? Because these parties who bicker, they're going to say, oh, this, I don't like this, I don't like this. They're going to withdraw their support. The whole thing crumbles. But there's a crisis. Italy is in war. So how did the parties respond to this? They responded um, shockingly. Well, or for now, meaning that almost all the parties agreed, joined into, uh, uh, into supporting, not just supporting this new Draghi, uh, Draghi uh, uh, cabinet, but in building a cabinet uh, in which the other ministerial positions are basically split between technocrats and party leaders. And that's what also what makes this government unique because it's a sort of a government of national unity it is perceived as such i'm talking about la lega i'm talking about forza italia i'm talking about m5s and i'm talking about the democratic party basically everybody except for one party fratelli d'italia all of the other parties voted to support and got some positions in this government that's truly a government of national unity as for example the uk had during world war ii when, you know, UK has a two-party system, but at that point, everybody was part of the government because it's war. That's the response that, that was, was given now. And they're all, and the reason why it was given was, you know, the crisis, the opportunity, but also Draghi. And Draghi, because he has this, this, this as I said, this unique stature, not just in Italy, but around the world. He's one of the most respected persons around the world, economists and so on. And it's that external status and position that that gives him also the stat stature uh, in Italy yeah because it's very it's very important for 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 Italians it's almost like you know countries used to do this when they you know new states in 19th century 18th century <coughs> uh, not just throughout history they used to import heads of state yeah they would inf import or borrow kings why because those kings were from lines monarchical lines that once they became your king, their stature as part of that monarchic line, yeah, also protected you as a state. Now that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a thing that has been done throughout history. Uh, the beginning of the Russian principalities, the first Rus uh, 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 princes were actually Scandinavian war, warriors who the local villagers asked to, why don't you lead us because you can also protect us, yeah? Later, it was stature, uh, uh, stature and, and statute um, uh, uh, in uh, 
status, sorry, status in, uh, in the Middle Ages, I'd say, when they would borrow of uh, Poland, borrowing the king of Hungary for a while when they didn't have a king or vice versa, or, you know, uh, their daughter or whatever, uh, Romania bringing in a, a king from a different, from a German line because of that stat uh, stat uh, status, and the United Kingdom, right? They, their line is the line of orange, is, is, is Germanic, uh, Dutch Germanic, yeah? Uh, so they borrowed basically a, a monarchic line. So what I'm saying is that this is a phenomenon as always with politics. This is why history is politics and politics is history. Uh, the phenomena are the same because humans, human beings are the same. Societies are essentially the same in different contexts. So uh, so that's international status that Draghi enjoys and, and, and stature with which, which he brings helped create this unity behind him. Now... We're going to look a, a little bit at the, 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 the very briefly at the composition of the uh, cabinet, but mostly at the program that he proposes, um, and then talk about well, okay, but what are these perspectives? How long will this stature or status of Draghi, this sort of a above politics, this sort of a you know his his nickname Super Mario, yeah, from from the game, uh, uh, not just by the Italians in general in the world. Uh, so how long will this uh, resist and survive in the specific context of uh, uh, Italian politics? So, so let's, let's, let's ponder a little bit that. So uh, <clears throat> let's look at um, the composition of the, of the cabinet really quickly, just to give us, get a sense. So uh, you'll have about, I don't know, seven, uh, maybe nine, uh, what it says here, independents, <clears throat> who are actually technocrats. And if you look at their personal, I linked some articles that discuss this cabinet, so I'm not going to go over it. But if you, go, if you look at their um, profile, they're you know, quite highly regarded specialists that Draghi uh, brought in. And then you have, <clears throat> let me put it this way, you, one could say that the, the classical um, key uh, ministries, meaning the ministries that usually parties want to get, uh, went to parties, while the more developmental reform key uh, uh, minist ministries went to technocrats. Clearly, that's kind of, the logic makes sense. Yeah, so you see that the minister of foreign affairs, which is usually sought by parties, went to uh, uh, parties. Five Star Movement in this case. Defense is another one. Uh, agriculture, um, not necessarily looked for, looked after. Labor went to, went, goes to center left, obviously. <coughs> Culture. Um, uh, then Forza Italia gets uh, public administration. La Lega gets tourism, uh, which is very important in Italy, and economic development. That's a key ministry, ministry uh, but they're also very concerned with the economy. But you see that the technocrats get economy and finance, very important, right? Um, interior. Uh, justice, uh, ecological transition. By the way, the establishment of this minister for uh, <coughs> ministry for the ecological transition, sort of a super ministry, is actually uh, was one of the demands of the Five Star Movement to uh, to support this new cabinet. Um, infrastructure is technocrat, education and research is technocrat, and so on. Uh, and minister for technological innovation and digital transition, obviously is uh, also a technocrat. So, um, so that's, a, that's, that's a brief overview of the composition. Let's look at, the, at, the, uh, at, at Draghi's, um, Draghi's program of, of governance. Um, <coughs> well, what, what, and I linked uh, his discourse uh, that um, in Italian, but you might find it somewhere in, in English as well. Um, <coughs> What, what stands out from his, one, uh, from his discourse, from his program, immediately, and kind of raises question marks for me, not, not negative ones, but in terms of perspectives, is that you know, he really accepted this task. He even called it the most important task he was ever called to uh, in his life, which, keeping in mind that he was the head of the European Central Bank and saved the euro, it's quite something to say. But what he means by this is that um, probably, it, or it seems, is that he truly looks at, uh, at this um, as an opportunity to truly rebuild, reconstruct, or re rethink um, Italy 
uh, as a state in the sense of you know administ administration, economic development, financial reform, I mean everything, education, whatever. And that kind of gives me sort of uh, tremors because I'm not sure that is the mandate that one he got, <coughs> truly got from the parties, or that he will be able to achieve. My feeling is that the parties gave him this mandate to solve the crisis and kind of start jumpstart Italy. But his plan is for a, a, a he's, he's looking forward to you know 2050. Of course, he doesn't want to be prime minister until then. He won't. He's 80 or 75 maybe, uh, but a very sprightly 75, as you can see, as you will see from the video. Um, but, um, well, shortly put, I don't think you will have the, the, the support. So, so what you will see, what, what the program kind of exposes is this duality of, of very long-term development, which is in keeping with the uh, next generation EU uh, package, right? Let's not forget, that's also for long-term development, rightly so. So he's not out of bounds, he's not like delusional. He wants to do something because there's, it's, it's like a world post-World War II situation in Italy, there's seemingly unity behind him. I wonder here. And there is truly the demand and the opportunity and the money to do that sort of a, a, a miracle that, that was achieved also with the Marshall Plan and in Italy after World War II. So, so there's short-term things in his program. There's long-term things, but it's all couched in this vision, and this is why he accepted the position. This is why kind of what it eh, makes me afraid for him because I think he wants more than he will be able to do in the sense, the, in a very concrete sense, uh, the specific sense of he will not get the time to do. But anyway, we'll see. Um, as usually, I'm not predicting. I don't do predictions. It's just we're trying to understand and analyze with the tools that we have. Um, and when we talk about perspectives, it, they, these, these, what I'm trying to say is what sort of results from, from this analysis, but I'm not saying that this is a prediction, or I don't do predictions, and I'm actually terrible at predictions. <clears throat> so clearly, you know, priorities here is COVID recovery and reform from vaccination plan, implementation, um, health system, you know, to, to our health system was huge, tremendously hit by the pandemic. Um, then education system, ecology, there you go. These, these uh, ecology and digital transformation are also prominent in his program, just like they are in uh, Next Generation EU. But also, for example, gender parity is a thing that keeps being repeated, was kept being repeating in his program. Um, it's also in the Next Generation EU, but um, it, it kind of sounds, uh, you know, um, but it's there. Well, it, it's there in the Next Generation EU, so, so yeah, you can find it in his program. It was an, it's an interesting discourse. Everybody praised it in Italy. Um, for me, it seemed, uh, I mean, obviously, very ambitious and, you know, solid in terms of, you know, this, these are serious people. But kind of, um, let me put it this way, I would have clarified the priorities in a different way. Um, because some things are priorities and some things are things that we also want to do. Anyway, but I'm not criticizing the program because, as I said, these are serious people with serious plans. Um, you know, reform of public policy, administration, implementation. So reform of the administration of the state, which is obviously needed. Uh, reform of, uh, of the taxation. I mean, these are huge things that he wants to do. Again, not, he doesn't want to do them. These are, this is not an, uh, an, you know, a plan with just looking just in the immediate future. This is a plan looking at a radical transformation. Uh, internationally, he's a uh, pro-EU and Atlanticist multilateralist and so on. So I see here sort of the classical liberal um, paradigm uh, in Mario Draghi. Um, so he says, the uh, de construire e reconstruire meglio. So you, you see, as I said, um, a combination of immediate things, like how uh, COVID vaccination is the priority, right? You know, I mean, they're set up. I mean, the problem is that there aren't enough vaccines, as, as, as in other countries in Europe. Um, but also reconstruction of, of some key dimensions like education, healthcare, 
public administration, fi finance, uh, and priorities uh, that are also in the next generation EU, but also in Italy, and they're needed in Italy, like uh, digitization or digitalization, right? Um, um, that, is, that is something that Italy has not yet gotten there, I think. Um, the emphasis on a sustainable development, um, also mentioned, you know, gender parity. Um, which, as I said, I'm mentioning it because he kept emphasizing it. And I, I just found it, you know, like, okay, but what are the priorities in terms of the environment? That's, that's part of it. We can also do this and this and this. It was an interesting discourse. It was an interesting discourse. Okay, so, so the main thing to take from this, from, for me, right, is, is this question of, of, I believe that there is unity be, behind getting Italy from this, hole in which it is, right? Not politically, but this, this sort of war situation and getting it through. And I think that there is a political trust in um, Draghi at this point and the, the unity to stand behind him, especially since they have those key government. That's important that the parties got, are actually part of the cabinet. But the program that he proposes, as I said, is more long-term. And that's where I doubt that this support can last for so long. I don't see it how. But who knows? I mean, I'm not making predictions because, you know, you might witness another moment of national unity and, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Italian miracle like after World War II. And people talk about national unity, but we, we have our doubts. So... Uh, how about the political effects uh, or some other political effects of, of, this, um, of this unique government? The government of, of national unity that in a country that is so fragmented that cannot get together a government that changes governments every year, now you have literally, um, if you look at the, 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 uh, the materials I linked, every party, the entire parliament voted for this government. And most of them, them uh, those forces also got positions in government which also invest them in supporting this government. Wow, I mean... Amazing, except for Fratelli d'Italia and except for some members of Movimento Cinque Stelle. And here's where problems, right? Natural problems, normal problems occur. I mean, first of all, let's take Fratelli d'Italia. Why didn't Fratelli d'Italia want to join this government? Um, because it, it, it um, well, from the, their point of view, this is a wise, this can, this can work out very well, actually. Already, they said, we got people wanting to join us, Fratelli Italia said, who now are somewhere at 4%. Uh, people who are dissatisfied with their own parties joining this government. Because there are some, <coughs> you know, unerasable differences between these, these, these parties. Like Movimento Cinque Stelle, anti-system party. And now, not only is it joining a government, which was bad enough, yeah, to join a government with... the uh, parties from the system, now it is joining part of government with the entire system. And yes, uh, when the Movimento Cinque Stelle took this decision to join uh, this government of national unity, the decision was taken after a vote by the members on that internet platform, Rousseau, that I mentioned. So formally there is like 57% supported it. So and the, the way it works there is that whatever the members say, the representatives uh, <clears throat> need to do. They're sort of agents of those, of, those, of those people. It's like, you know, they're just puppets. Um, but of course they're not, because that's not how representation works. This is where it, the, the, the direct democracy thing clashes with the representation part, because when you send representatives, they know better than you do, because they spend their time there, and they also have their own moral decisions, and then you tell them, no, no, you just jump the way I tell you. But you don't know what's happening here. You you're, you're don't follow politics. You're not involved in all these discussions. You just have an idea and you, you're forcing me to do something. So what happened is that some of the representatives of Movimento Cinque Stelle went against this decision of the members of the party and voted against the Draghi government in parliament. And of course, immediately, then the rest of the party said, you need to kick out. The leadership said, we need to kick out these, uh, these members of, these representatives of Movimento Cinque Stelle from the party, because when the members say something, we need to do it. On the other hand, people complained that this vote was uh, problematic 
online because the question was sort of the way the question was framed, the time they had, and whatever. Because within Movimento Cinque Stelle, unsurprisingly, you have this sort of a horizontal internet-based direct democracy in which the members say and the representatives do sort of a thing. But also you have a very powerful authoritarian figure of Beppe Grillo. Because, you know, you know, read Plato, right? And you will see that what happens uh, after uh, democracy, well, democracy gener uh, degenerates, degenerates into chaos, and what comes is a dictator. So, because the antithesis of everybody does whatever they want is someone makes order. And this is something known for thousands of years, yeah? Well, guess what? That's the same thing happening in Movimento Cinque Stelle. You have one guy, sort of a authori authority, authoritarian, figure within the party, and then you have a horizontal platform. And, and this is it, basically what he says goes and what they say go. It's this, this interplay. And in between, you have the representatives. Well, I said I would talk about Fratelli d'Italia, but I've been talking about Movimento Cinque Stelle. Yes, that too is a question how it fares. Now, how Movimento Cinque Stelle will fare out of this is that it will split. I mean, it already split, meaning a number of their representatives from the parliament will leave the party. And that's the only other major group of, of, of representatives in the parliament that uh, voted against the, the cabinet, a part of Movimento Cinque Stelle, because, hey, we're anti-system, what are you doing? And, um, and then Fratelli d'Italia. So Fratelli d'Italia, uh, as I said, they, from their point of view, their rhetoric is this. Every government needs an opposition, and we're willing, and uh, we, we want to be a, a real opposition, meaning uh, uh, <coughs> an intelligent patriotic, they say, because they're the sort of a nationalist patriotic force, Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, um, a patriotic opposition, meaning that we will support the government on those things that we think are right, and we will not support the government on those things that we think are wrong. We're not like against it as a whole. We are a principled sort of opposition. Usually, this is how it's put. They say patriotic opposition. It makes sense, and you know, when there's a... Uh, this is like a um, grand coalition, like, you know, what happens when two parties of the opposite... Two, the two major parties from the opposite points on the spectrum who usually alternate in power suddenly make the government together as it happened in Germany in the past 10-15 years that's called a grand coalition that's not normal that happens when they can't find enough allies on each side to alternate in power either this in power or the other one in power grand coalition well this is a grand coalition Italian style but you know, national unity coalition what happens, however, in, terms, in times of grand coalition is that, you know, there will always be people unsatisfied with those in power. So when you have a grand coalition, right, um, still, people, some people will be dissatisfied with whatever is happening. So in these cases, it's the parties staying outside that gain. Because, again, it's natural. Oh, there will always be dissatisfaction. And what Fratelli d'Italia said, um, um, Giorgia Meloni from Fratelli d'Italia said was that they already had many people from Movimento Cinque Stelle, this is why I, I went into that discussion, and from other forces uh, who want to join them because they felt betrayed by their party for joining this grand coalition. So, um, but how about La Lega? La Lega, who is a, a, a right-wing party who used to be, you know, uh, Eurosceptic, but I mean, used to be against, uh, fiercely against the central left uh, PD, fiercely against Movimento Cinque Stelle. They hate each other. You know, they had a government together, but they fell apart. Why did they join? Will they gain or will they lose? Now they're the strongest party on the center right. Even you know before this, uh, and now they they even grew in the in the opinion polls. But is this going to um, help them or? Sort of, they had a populist anti-system dimension themselves as well. And it seems to be what and people say, uh, other people say it as well, that it seems to be part of a move by um, um, La Lega, by the League, uh, towards the center. Because if you want to grow, as I said, you cannot be a fringe regional party. You need to move, but to move also ideologically. In order to be a, a large party that is able to win, yeah, you need to become from an ideological party to become a 
catch all umbrella party. Umbrella party means that you broaden your platform to include more than just a niche sort of view. And the more extreme your view, the more niche it is. So the more you move to the center, this is, which is where most voters are, the more you have the chance of growing. There's always this, this is the, always the exchange between parties because the parties in the center, center right, left, center right, are the most successful ones. But that also means that they make compromises because they need to, to, to bring many people of many opinions together. And the more purist the parties are, the smaller they are because the fewer people they have supporting them. So the center-right parties are uh, criticized for being compromised and the purist parties are criticized for being extreme. And that's always the interplay. So I think, I think, and other people say that uh, La Lega, well, I don't think, but it seems that La Lega is part of their move to the center. They might even want to join the European uh, uh, People's Party, um, EPP, European Popular Party, European People's Party, which is the major center-right sort of family uh, of, of parties um, at European level. Uh, you know, in the European Parliament, uh, each country sends its own parties, right, obviously. But there they need to form coalitions and their groups, center-right, center-left. And the big center-right group at European level is, European, is the EPP. And, I, I, uh, and La Lega used to be, used, obviously, it was further right from the EPP. That I, th I think they also, with their move to the center, want to also join the EPP, which would also increase their voice at European level. So, so these are some of the... Um, interesting uh, consequences um, of, of, this, of this new uh, uh, government. As I said, um, there are uh, lots of questions. Uh, the two major guarantors of this, of these, of this new, well, there are major, several guarantors of the success of this, or stability of this new uh, government, which is the crisis itself. The fact that the EU package is not a lump sum, but they need to meet goals and then get the next sum. So if you remove the government immediately, you still need the government to implement the same program for the next years, right? Because the program needs to be submitted by Italy by April 30th and then needs to be implemented over several years. So that's also sort of a stim stimulant towards, well, keeping the government in place. The fact that the political parties have positions in government also you know, leans towards supporting the cabinet, but they're going to be here. Um, the stature of Dag Draghi and his, uh, you know, uh, his stature, international and national, but that gets eroded in politics very fast. But also the president, Mattarella. Mattarella is also, he's the one who's, who, who dragged the, you know, out of crisis, created the, the sort of a miraculous solution of government of national unity. He's, all, he's hugely respected. We don't have time to go into the details of his um, uh, profile, but suffice it to say that he's a sort of a center-left, but with Christian democratic roots. His father was actually one of the colleagues of Alcide de Gasperi, who established the Christian Democratic Party in Italy and who is one of the fathers of Italy, of modern Italy, post-World War II Italy. So he has a very good pedigree that combines Christian democracy with center-left. He used to be, whatever, uh, judge in the Constitutional Court and so on. He's the one to whom everyone listens to, which is, uh, and at least his voice is the stable factor. Drag is a stable factor. You have the crisis, you have the EU package. But we'll see what happens. In any case, Italian politics. One thing we can always say, and without derision, but uh, genuinely always interesting. And now for some uh, uh, other, uh, you know, interesting um, Another interesting subject, a uh, briefer uh, uh, discussion here. Uh, and as I mentioned, this uh, brief discussion, briefer topic, let's put it this way, the minor topic of the day, let's put it this way, uh, will deal with um, a, a series of seven instructional films made by famous acclaimed director Frank Capra in World War II, uh, a series called Why We Fight. Now, Frank Capra is one of the great directors in the history of, uh, of film, American film and film in general, uh, with titles like, I mean, really incredible list of, of titles like It's a Wonderful Life, uh, It Happened One Night, You Can't Take It With You, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, uh, Meet John Doe, Arsenic and Old Lace, and so on and so on. And so on. <coughs> uh, uh, I mean, truly, you know, uh, memorable um, uh, 
you know, one of the most memorable movies uh, in the history of cinema. And uh, I remember uh, reading uh, in his autobiography about about this uh, this series of um, of, of instructional films uh, that he did during World War II, and uh, I didn't know about them before reading in his autobiography some years ago. And um, it was very interesting. I mean, okay, let's rewind what's happening. It's World War II. Um, United States, which has pursued a policy of, of um, isolationism, basically, uh, and non-interventionism for the past decades, I mean, at least since the First World War had a radical turn uh, in the sense of only a few years, and then joined World War II, uh, and then people uh, volunteered here from refusing even the idea of, of, of meddling in, you know, again, getting involved with those Europeans who, who fight among themselves. From that, after Pearl Harbor, you had people volunteering in droves and people experiencing being refused from, from signing up as, as a personal tragedy and humiliation. Um, if you look, if you watch that, uh, another movie called Hacksaw Ridge, again, a true story, uh, you, uh, you, saw, you see there how... how uh, Normal and and how how what a moral duty uh, how, um, it was to 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 sign up to to, to join the war effort, and that that uh, reached to many strata in the population. Famously, you had these these, these major actors like James Stewart used to be a, an aviator, decorated, uh, highly recognized in England. David Niven uh, and many others. So even you know Hollywood figures or, or figures from the world of film joined. Now Capra, he wasn't at the age to join in arms, but he joined with what he could do. And that's interesting because, you know, is this like a huge contribution? He was, you know, awarded uh, some medals for it. <clears throat> but, and if you look at the series, this is why we fight, uh, then you will see that the contribution was indeed, I mean, remarkable from, from many ways, and it remains, a, uh, you know, really a, uh, an impressive achievement uh, that I can tell you genuinely, does does not feel outdated. These movies do not feel outdated. These are gripping, uh, fascinating uh, 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 films. So uh, you can watch them, by the way, um, on Amazon in various formats. They, uh, um, but also I saw I saw that they are available on YouTube. Someone posted them on YouTube as well. So and the, you're also gonna get a link in the blog uh, to uh, uh, you know just to see a list of them to see what to look for. So this why we fight. Um, as I said, is a series of seven uh, inst instructional, informational uh, films, 50, 60 minutes each, like about an hour each, uh, <coughs> that range from Prelude to War, I'm going to give you the titles, The Nazi Strike, Divide and Conquer, The Battle of Britain, The Battle of Russia, The Battle of China, and War Comes to America. And the purpose of these initially was to do them, and they were made for, for the fighting troops. So they were... Uh, sort of instructional informational videos for the fighting troops, but then they were, I don't know, they were probably appreciated so much that they were actually presented to the entire population, so for public consumption. And, you know, just with many other things in, in uh, with World War II, uh, World War II has changed not just the world, but also the United States and the institutions and so on. Uh, I mean, at that at the point when when Capra tr uh, tried to do something along these way these these lines, there was no institutional framework within the the military for him to do that. <laughs> they didn't have a propaganda department, so at first he had to to work with the so-called signal corps, which simply managed communication, wartime communication. And then, as you, I think, uh, as you look at the different episodes, because the episodes come out between forty two and nineteen forty four, so over like two or three years, so you will see also changes in the sort of the institutional framework that backed and supported this, uh, these, these films. Some new offices and departments are formed, just like, you know, the CIA and, and uh, you know, many institutions in American military and American politics, in fact, and government were born out of World War II as a, as a result of, uh, like the National Security Council, for example, as a result of, of that experience. You know, simply they didn't have any you know, propaganda department or any CIA or any... Because it wasn't needed because they weren't involved internationally so much. So, so, that's, so basically, you know, uh, Frank Capra kind of you know, did some pioneering work. And uh, I think you remember that he had to appeal to his own resources to, uh, at first. 
On the other hand, uh, these um, movies also clearly benefited from the know-how of the, of the people in the military because I must tell you, um, they're tremendously well documented. But anyway, let's, let's kind of look at some of the aspects of these, of these films. Um, you know, you can watch them like once, one every evening or something. Uh, they're, they're quite something. So aspects that kind of stood out for me uh, and I want to point out to you. Um, so what are these, in fact? <clears throat> right, the purpose of, 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 the, of the films, obviously, is to tell the public, first the fighting troops and then the larger public, is why we fight. So as a, clearly, there is a, this, is, this is a series of, of films with, with, a, with a message, right, with a purpose, yeah? Well, but is it propaganda? Well, I would argue it's not, right? Uh, clearly, it wants to, to, to as again, it has a message, but it's not propaganda in the negative sense of the term. These are, uh, and, and there are several reasons why. And probably the most important reason why it's not propaganda is because, let me see if I can find uh, the quote exactly from, um, yeah. The purpose of these films is to give factual information as to the causes, the events, and the principles for which we are fighting. And that's what sets them apart because, okay, there's a type of principles there where you can say, oh, no, there's propaganda. Not necessarily, not entirely, but the factual, the quality of the factual information and of the coverage of the events from political events in different countries, from international politics, uh, from military operations, which are described in, with such amazing clarity. I don't remember seeing anything on History Channel or whatever discovery with, with such clarity. Um, well, obviously, due to the fact that they had the specialists from the War Department doing all those maps of troop movements and so on. Um, so the amount of detail and the factual information and the seriousness with which they are presented uh, and the fact that you know, the, the spectator, that the public is treated as an adult that can understand these things and the, not all of these being you know, necessarily that simple. Uh, you know, and a lot of numbers and information and, and economy and people and size and territory. I mean, this is not propaganda. This is informational uh, uh, communication, informational f a series of informational films, as, as it was advertised, as it was proposed to do, with a message, with a goal, right? So, you know, we want to show you why we fight, but, you know, this is truly why we fight. Of course, some corners were cut. So, so that's what, one thing that stands out is the quality, the informational quality of these films. The second, as I said, that they are not, they do not feel outdated. I mean, uh, for, 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 for many reasons, including the, the quality of the information included there. Uh, but also because of the cinematographic quality of, of, of these films, which I'm going to uh, treat in a second. And, and uh, as a note, uh, I always, I always enjoy, it's a personal note, I always tremendously enjoy, um, uh, let's say, reading history books written sometime in history. Right? So let's say I have, I have a, a wonderful survey of European uh, politics or European history, 19th century European history, written in, by an American in 1910 or thereabouts. So the perspective of early 20th century over the 19th century, it's fascinating because their perspective, that persp you see, history is a narrative that we make of the past. It's not the past itself. Yeah? So... Uh, and you notice this every day. You find that there's a new paradigm people use to, to read history. Um, uh, and we always read it from the perspective of where we are, sort of thinking that, well, we are the end of history, we know what's right and wrong, we're going we're gonna to explain what happened. Well, no, because if you ask the people then, probably they would give you a different narrative, or slightly, at least slightly different narrative. This is why it's fascinating to get materials that deal with history, or contemporary events, but were written somewhere in the past, or produced somewhere in the past, um, so, which is why I also like this. So let me give you an example. For example, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the series that you could watch in parallel with, with, with the Why We Fight series is Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers is that uh, fictional TV series, which is based on three events and through uh, people on, on the... On the what happened with the Easy Company, E Company of the 101 Airborne in World War II. So that true story is made into a 10-episode HBO series famously, 
was made into that in the 2001, I think, by Spielberg and Tom Hanks. They produced it. Uh, fantastic series. Really, really well done. And again, it's real events, but it's a, as a, as a fictional, uh, 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 you know, 10, 10 episode series, uh, but depicting real events. Uh, so uh, it's v- very involving and it kind of immerses you into the lived experience of, of, the, of warfare. It, it's a famous, I'm sure many of you have heard of this series, The Band of Brothers. Now, you can watch that in parallel with this, with this um, if you want, or after you watch Why We Fight. Uh, and I, the reason why I bring it up is, is because the this, this series of Frank Capra information, informational films is called Why We Fight. Uh, Band of Brothers has one episode, episode 9, which is called Why We Fight, which is clearly a reference to the Frank Capra series. Um, but episode 9 of Band of Brothers, Why We Fight, called Why We Fight, is actually about the, the soldiers from Easy Company stumbling upon and being shocked and overwhelmed at the discovery of a concentration camp in Germany. Remember that the existence of concentration camps well, was known vaguely or in some, some, some intelligence circles, but it wasn't like a common knowledge thing. So it was a huge shock when they discovered not just their existence, but the scale. But when Spielberg says why we fight and calls that episode why we fight, he says that this is why we fight, which clearly was not true. Because this is our reading from today, picturing it into the back. Because yeah, <coughs> we fought and we also solved that issue, put an end to that criminal endeavor, to that genocide implicitly. But that wasn't why we went to fight, because we didn't even know, really, or that wasn't common knowledge, that wasn't the common narrative. And the reason why we know this is because you go to Why We Fight Made by Capra and you have references to you know the abuses and brutality of the, let's say, the Nazi regime, but not to concentration camps because they didn't know it. It wasn't common knowledge. Why we fight in Capra is a whole different other set of of reasons which are not separate, but sort of implicitly include also the brutality um, that we later learned about uh, of of what the Nazis did in in the concentration uh, uh, camps. But it's just so interesting that you have the perspective from now, sort of reading into those events something that we know now, they didn't know then, obviously. They didn't know then, and that wasn't why we fight. Now, looking back, we can say that's also why us fighting was good, and it's true. Okay, so um, um, so, so it's interesting always to, to, to have such historical perspectives on history. So let's talk a little bit about the, the principles, right? Because I said, uh, you know, uh, they said that this is a description of the events, causes, causes events, and, and, and principles. And principles is an important part of, of this whole narrative. Um, and it's interesting how you go from film to film, and you notice those series of films that are kind of chronological, like how the regimes grew in Italy, Germany, and Japan, and then how they... Um, uh, started incorporating Austria and the Czech Republic, and then how they took over in Poland and China, and then how they uh, betrayed all their promises, and then went to Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, Scandinavia, and then France, and then the Battle of Britain, and then the Battle of Russia, and then the Battle of China. It's chronological in terms of up to Pearl Harbor. Literally, that's the last thing of the series. Because, you know, after Pearl Harbor, there's nothing to explain anymore because everybody knows what happened after Pearl Harbor. But this is kind of to give the context to people who mostly have been isolated or, you know, the farm boy from Nebraska uh, literally had no clue of what the heck uh, is happening and who, why, you know, who are these people. And uh, both because, yeah, in Nebraska there's not much to care about these, uh, these developments, but also because there wasn't, as I said, a trend of isolationism that was both in the, you know, the common perception and the public opinion, but also politically, there was a sort of aggressive policy of isolationism, and we're, gonna, we're not going to get involved with the Europeans again. You know, one world war was enough, which changed quickly in a few years. So, so you know, people who had no idea of, so let's give them information, and they did. But let's also uh, explain to them, you know, um, uh, you know what? You know there's there's a message dimension here. There's the principles dimension here. Ideas. And but as you go chronologically, and in each movie he needs to talk about. You know the the, the filmmaker needs to talk about or the narrator needs to talk about principles. But you notice how those principles sort of get couched in different terms. 
from the first movies, from films, to when you get to Russia and get to China. Because at the beginning, and at the last, in the last movie, in the last film, he, uh, the principles are basically freedom versus slavery. Yeah? A free world, literally there is a globe, it says the free, uh, illuminated globe, free world, and a darkened globe, slave world, right? Um, that there's two globes coexisting, and now they're at war. So there's this freedom against slavery <coughs> uh, uh, dimension, uh, then democracy versus, uh, you know, um, a, a, a regimented, um, regimented regimes, and there's these footages about, you know, people's marching and marching and marching, and that's also true, right? The democracy and the democratic, uh, the democratic world versus these non-democratic regimes, and truly, that's how you know Mussolini and and, and Hitler couched their fight. It, it was against the democratic world because democracy was a bad word. Word, um, but but then you get to the Battle of Russia, and it's going to be hard to make the 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 argument that it's the same. You know, the battle of a democracy with a non-democratic country, Russia, right? USSR, of course, was not a democracy. So how? Then is 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 that conflict framed nicely though? It was framed in that episode, as you will see if you watch it, is framed as the a war of the regular folk of the people against an aggressor, a brutal aggressor. Which, before you say, well, that's a cop out. No, it's not, because <coughs> World War II was experienced as such in the USSR. Um, even Stalin, you know, opened churches that have been, you know, closed and abused and, and uh, imprisoned. They opened them because and the whole and because he needed to, to mobilize the population and he knew that he's not going to mobilize them behind a regime that has been torturing them, basically, uh, you know, wave after wave of, of 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 killing, you know, that his regime has been perpetrating on on his population. So so he couched it as a war of. Of national survival, of, of patriotic war for the homeland, and for simple survival. And it was perceived as such because it also was that. Because the idiot Nazis, right, what did they do? I'm saying idiot because, you know, not just because of their ideology, but also because of the stupidity involved there in the sense of some of the peoples in the Soviet Union did not want to be a part of the Soviet Union and would have been natural allies to the advancing troops against the Soviet Union. Yeah? The Nazis, because of their racial uh, ideology, massacred them in mass, committed genocide, ethnic cleansing in Ukraine. U Ukrainians who were just, you know, famished and killed by Stalin, right? <laughs> who did not like Stalin. But yeah, way to turn everyone against you. Anyway, so the, brut the sheer brutality, remember for the, you know, the Nazi uh, ideology, the, the Slavic was a lower form of being, the Slav, and, and needed to be exterminated. Uh, and that's what they did. So the lived experience of the brutality and the fact that you literally have no other choice but to fight unless otherwise they will die. There's no compromise left. Uh, they will kill you. Um, that was understood. Yeah. So that was a national fight. It was a war, a patriotic war. Yeah. It was a war for the homeland. So Capra framing or whoever you know wrote the script framing the episode in that way is not actually false. You know, Stalin appears once in the whole in the whole uh, episode with one short quote. Guess who who else appears with one short quote in the same episode? The head of the Orthodox Church in Russia. Clearly, they didn't have the same importance or role in the, in the Soviet Union at the moment. But so, yeah, uh, you know, why we fight? You know, war on Russia, war on Britain, war on China. Russia, China, and Britain then becomes who? Become our allies. Yeah? Become our allies. You're not going to portray the ally in a negative, uh, you know, you're not going to insist on the negative parts. You're not going to deal with that. Because in this context, you're going to insist on, on the ally dimension. Same with China. I, of course, at that point in China was not communist, but there were communist forces. They're not mentioned once in the, in the, in the film. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, Chiang Kai-shek is um, uh, 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 and Sun Yat-sen are mentioned, uh, and so on. Uh, and again, there as well is basically a war of a, is the is the uprising of a is the resistance basically of of a people of the human beings of the masses of the folk um, 
uh, and in, in an effort of national unity against a, a brutal, brutal aggressor, which was true, which was completely true, which was completely true. Um, so, you know, there are certain things that are not insisted upon, but the factual information is accurate and it's true, yeah? Um, but it's interesting that, okay, so you have free world versus slave world, democracy versus regimented regimes. Then when you get to Russia and China, it's the war of the United Nations, us and allies, versus the aggressors, the imperialists, these powers, Axis powers bent on world conquest, also true. But the rhetoric becomes United Nations. And also is mentioned civilization versus barbarism, also finally good versus evil. Um, and um, okay, other, other aspects. Uh, so I mentioned cinematography and, and the cinematic value of these films. It's utterly spectacular, utterly spectacular. They have footage, fantastic footage, both from the, you know, the, the US military, what they had, footage captured from, by Germans. So you have footage from German planes, you know, from inside German planes. You have uh, uh, documentary footage from other countries. And they also used uh, like historical fiction uh, from uh, uh, footage from different movies because one thing that I uh, again is fascinating about these documentaries and is to be appreciated is the is the breadth and again seriousness and and um, sort of um, uh, of, of the, the approach of, of Frank Capra the fact that he takes his uh, listeners and remember at first these were just simple soldiers then the general public as adults. And, and uh, you know, because the narrative goes into history, you know, I literally, with Russia, with, um, with, uh, with China, it goes back 3,000 years. And it shows, you know, the, the previous battles between the Russians and the Teutonic Germans using, you know, footage from Russian films, if I'm correct. Um, uh, it might be from... Um, um, uh, uh, some, some, some famous uh, uh, Soviet films. Uh, but the, the breadth and, and the fact uh, of, of the view that includes history and includes culture. Culture is something that is tremendously prominent in, in all, of this, uh, all of these films. Very un-American, right? And the reason why I say very un-American is because when he gets to, to talking about War Comes to America, where he goes over literally from the beginning, from the 30s, um, how America went from isolationism to getting involved, and it's, again, it's a tremendous uh, episode because it really it talks about depression and, and gangsterism and criminality and unemployment, and then talks about, you know, analyzes individual well, it describes individual Congress bills and and uh, that were directed at not getting involved and the political is sort of work behind the scenes. I mean really serious information, I, I, very enjoyably done. And then, um, and then gets, to, gets, to, gets to today, um, and even it goes back into history uh, to, to start with because it says, you know, uh, you know, founding of America, and that's where it talks about the principles again, it says, you know, but interestingly and rightly so, it says, uh, without these principles, right, which are political principles, right, of the founding fathers, of the framers, uh, who wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, there would be no country. And without the country, there would be no principles in the sense of they wouldn't have an embodiment. Now, this is very important. Okay, there is a message that you mentioned here, but it's also uh, true and important because the principles he talks about are political principles. And what he's saying is something accurate, is that this is a, this is a, um, a state and a national identity, the United States and the uh, America or the American nation that is not built on culture. It is built on political ideas. And without those political ideas, there would be no national identity because they give the national identity. It's not the common culture. It's a common, although political ideas are also part of culture, but it's a political definition that creates nationhood and then statehood, the United States, uh, and not culture. While in most parts of the world, it's the opposite. It's culture. It's a cultural identity that creates nationhood, that defines nationhood, and then uh, claims statehood. And he is aware of this, even if not explicitly, but describes it this way. And, you know, without principles, there would be no nation. But without this nation or state, those principles would not be embodied. Hence, because those principles are so embodied, you know, equality and freedom in our, in our, in our, identity as a, as a nation and as a state, 
and because the uh, Germans, uh, Italian, the Nazis, fascists, and you know imperialist in Japan, their very uh, core of those regimes are uh, the opposition to these principles. You see how these principles cannot coexist. And of course, I also shown you in all the previous movies how films how every single promise they said was broken, which is true, and every uh, every single uh, act. I mean. The result of every such broken promise was massacre, which is also true. And, and brutality and barbarism, which is true, barbarism, because that's what happened. Uh, so it's civilization versus barbarism. So, so my point was that while in, uh, when he talks about other countries, he insists on culture. When he talks about U.S. history, it becomes clear that this, it's, not, it's less about culture in that tr traditional sense of civilization, but more in the sense of political identity, political ideas. He knows that implicitly uh, or explicitly and, and, and manifests that. So it's quite fascinating. But back to uh, cinematography. So there is tremendous footage and, and also the way the footage is used, uh, the aesthetic dimensions, uh, dimension of, the, of these films is, is fascinating. I mean, those images of nighttime bombings, just light and dark and light and dark, uh, the, the war time footage of conflict, of combat, I mean, plus some gruesome, gruesome footage as well, um, which is presented factually as a matter of fact, not, you know, to, you know, to scare or whatever, but it's also part of it. And remember, this was destined to soldiers who have seen, you know, gruesome things. Um, so, uh, but uh, the editing, I mean, it's aesthetically also, like, uh, these are like movies. And of all the of all the films, um, and I think I'm going to conclude with that. Um, of all these films, the one that deals with with the Battle of Britain is was the most engaging for me personally. <coughs> Although the U.S. one was also interesting, and China, I learned things there that I didn't know. Um, but the the Britain one was the most engaging for me because it was the most narrative like uh, story like episode. Uh, it also included a lot of either reenactments or, you know, human dimension, um, more personalized uh, aspects. So it got you more involved and it was all like a narrative that you understood the beginning and the end. Um, uh, I found that the most, the most enthralling, but all of them are, are, are quite sensational. The China one, as I said, it's, it's breathtaking, some footage there. Uh, they're all gripping, they're all tremendously enjoyable and... Um, in, in, in that sense, but also tremendously, as I said, tremendously inform, uh, informative. Uh, and I admire and respect, um, even with the, some of the corners that were caught, like let's not mention Stalin too much, um, that, that it was rigorous, detailed, and factually, I mean, you will not find any discovery or history channel documentary that gives you so many facts. I would say, I, at least in my perception, this is a much more factually, um, uh, you know, serious uh, series of movies, even if they have a, a, a message. Okay, well, that's, that's it. Um, that's it for uh, the third episode of our uh, podcast. <clears throat> I will see you in two weeks, uh, usually on Monday, unless uh, things happen. Uh, that can make it that make it impossible or uh, uh, difficult to have it on Monday, but normally on every two weeks on Monday, uh, with uh, the next episode of this podcast. Um, if you have any um, uh, notes, reactions, opinions, uh, please feel free to uh, post them actually in the comments below. As usually, the um, you know, in the description box, you will find links to the blog uh, post that corresponds to this uh, podcast episode. And there you can find more links supporting or expanding on the topics covered uh, today. Uh, thank you and uh, have a good rest of the week and two more weeks until we see each other. <laughs>